So far, all the models for both regression and classification were equally applicable to data that was first transformed via basis functions. Now in this short video, I'm going to briefly remind you of the usefulness of basis functions, uh, now in the classification setting, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about their limitations. And this will eventually motivate us to make learning of basis functions part of our modeling approach. And this will eventually lead to the formulation of multi-layer perceptrons or neural networks. But first things first, let's take a look at a toy example where basis functions are clearly beneficial. Now suppose we are given this two-dimensional data set. So we have uh, features, uh, like two features, can be anything, and I have two classes. And I want to separate these two classes, so one indicated in red and the other in blue, via a, a linear classification model, or maybe generalized linear classification model. Then there's no way I'm going to be able to separate uh, these two classes with just a linear um, a classifier, right? So I could draw a, a decision boundary somewhere over here um, that will classify this correctly, this correctly, but then this part won't uh, be classified correctly. And I can try out all sorts of uh, decision boundaries, but none of them uh, would work. Now this is a, a nice example of where we can use basis functions to turn this into a linear classification problem. So we can design, uh, we can pick basis functions such that uh, the data transforms in the following way, that uh, the, the blue data points can be clearly separated with a linear decision boundary from the red uh, data points. Now in this particular example, we're going to do that via Gaussian basis, basis functions, uh, where we uh, center a Gaussian function around this point over here and this point over here. Um, so let's say this Gaussian has an average or a mean value mu1 and uh, this particular one has a mean value mu2. So what does that look like? So my first feature value is going to be obtained by mapping this point x to this first basis function. And this first basis function was a, a a Gaussian basis function, so that means an exponential to the power of minus a half x minus mu one, so the distance to the first center x minus mu two. And then I have this uh, second basis function phi two of x, which essentially uh, computes the affinity or closeness of a data point x to the second mean. Okay, so that's the second basis function. It's also a Gaussian basis function. And that's how we could interpret this, right? So this uh, basis function, essentially, uh, what's happened in inside this exponential is I'm going to compute the distance from a point x to this mu, and I'm going to pull this through this exponential. So whenever this distance is small, this exponential will have a large value. Uh, and whenever this distance is large, for example, uh, points over here have a large distance to this uh, mean, uh, then e to the power of minus something large will lead to a, a small value. Okay, so this first basis function computes the first component of my new feature vector, right? And the second basis function computes uh, the second component of my new uh, feature vector. So each data uh, point um, now gets a new location in this new feature uh, space. Okay, so let's see how this works. So we have this cluster of points. All these points, they are close to this first Gaussian uh, mean. They are close to mu1. So that means that they will have a large value um, for obtained from uh, the first basis function. So they will have a large uh, phi1 component. Uh, so large means close to one because the distance is close to zero. This exponential is close to one. So it will correspond to this, this particular set of points. Now, if I focus on uh, the red cluster, so all these points, they are very close to mu2, so they will have a large uh, feature vector phi2, or far large feature value phi2, so this actually corresponds to this set of points, right? So because phi2 is very close to 1, it's because all these points are uh, close uh, to mu2. And then finally we have this set of points. These set of points, they are very far away from mu1, so they will have a value close to zero. And the distance is large, so e to the power or minus something large will bring it to zero. So we indeed see that the phi1 components of this cluster uh, takes on uh, small values. And if you compare it to the mu2 cluster, obviously these points are further away than the red points, so they will have a lower value in phi2, 
and they're about the same distance away. So this cluster is about the same distance away to this average as this cluster is. So they have about the same uh, value for the, the feature value uh, phi2. Okay, so each data point, each point x gets mapped to a new uh, point phi of x. This is the vector obtained by stacking these basis uh, function values and these were the points x. Okay, so now this is what we've been doing all along when we talked about uh, working with basis functions. We have an input vector x and we can transform it to a new vector space via these basis functions. And now we are going to perform classification in this new, um, well, a new vector space. And because of our clever choice of basis functions, in this particular case they were Gaussians, we were able to uh, nicely separate the groups and now this actually enables us to work with a linear classifier, with a linear decision boundary, simply by focusing on, well primarily essentially this is feature value phi2, so this essentially tells us that um, all points for which the phi2 feature value is large, those belong to the red class. So in a way maybe I could also um, build a classifier just based on this feature vector, uh, but in the general case, well, um, you want to use different uh, basis functions to come up with a nice decomposition of your input data. Okay, so this is a very clear advantage of basis functions, right? So with a proper choice of basis functions, we can turn this highly nonlinear classification problem in uh, essentially a linear classification problem via these uh, basis function transformations. But this already also exposes a limitation of basis functions because now I know what the data looks like. I work with 2D data, I can visualize this, I can get an impression of how my data is distributed and I can come up with clever choices for my basis functions. But what if you go to higher dimensional uh, data sets, then it becomes very messy to make these kind of uh, visualiz visualizations and come up with, with proper, with decent choices uh, for the basis functions. Right, so um, let's just quickly go over some advantages and disadvantages of working with basis functions. Maybe first and foremost, uh, these uh, basis functions allow for, for building nonlinear mo models or nonlinear mappings from input variables to target variables through basis functions. And that's what we're doing here, right? My classify in itself is linear, but I first uh, pull my uh, input vectors x through some nonlinear function mapping um, and Okay, so essentially the whole pipeline is nonlinear in that sense with respect to x, so that allows me to build very complex uh, functions in the end. And once we've defined our basis functions, then uh, the methods that we're used to work with in, uh, on the input space x, uh, they equally apply well to these new feature values. And that leads actually to the fact that we can obtain closed form solutions for least squared problems, and that we still have that, uh, can work with a tractable uh, Bayesian treatment, where this tractable Treatment basically means that we work with, with linear uh, function mappings and such. And uh, so once, we ha once we've been through this nonlinear mapping, then everything else uh, can be kept simple, essentially. Now, some possible limitation of this is that uh, these basis functions, they are fixed, right? They're not learned. So I have to decide, decide on them, I have to choose them. And once I make my decision, uh, I keep them as they is. But ideally, maybe you also want to incorporate this as part of your modeling framework to also optimally select or actually learn these basis functions. Now that is an issue which we're going to solve in one of the upcoming videos when we talk about neural networks or multi-layer perceptrons. Then we consider um, the modeling of these functions uh, as part of the, the learning process itself. And another limitation is actually uh, this curse of dimensionality, right? So if my dimensionality grows, well, first of all, it makes it very complicated uh, for us to come up with choices for the basis functions. Uh, but also, we want our basis functions to cover my entire space, right? Um, because we want every input point x to be mapped to some meaningful uh, new feature value. Uh, so that means, especially if you go to higher dimensionals, uh, higher dimensions, uh, we have a higher, and larger and larger space to cover with basis functions. So that leads to a very rapid growth of uh, the number of basis functions. Okay, that basically covers uh, what we call the curse of dimensionality, which is also discussed in chapter one of the book of Bishop. Now, what we're going to do in the later videos, we're going to focus on this limitation that the basis functions are fixed, and we're going to actually learn this via multi-layer perceptrons.
But before we get there, we will continue uh, going over uh, the three methods for uh, classification. So discriminative methods, uh, probabilistic generative modeling, and well, next up is uh, probabilistic discriminative modeling using uh, logistic regression.